based its core understanding of what it means to be the church on having an enemy. I mean, it's a playbook that probably started about 10 years after Jesus ascended to heaven, and it just kind of shows back up over and over again. People will say, we must know what it is that we are against, who we are fighting, and once we know that, then we will know who we are and what our purpose is. But I don't think that's what Jesus preached at all. Now, Jesus had conflict. He had conflict with the religious, cultural, political structures of the day, but he did not make them into his enemy. Instead, he tried to shift the perspective that people had. One time he was talking to a group of elite people, and he kind of said, but you see those over there, those people that you, the elite, have rejected, you look down your nose at them, you've marginalized them, you've caused suffering upon them, they're going to the kingdom of God ahead of you, which would have made their, their blood boil at the thought of such a thing. But notice that Jesus did not say without you. He simply says ahead of you. He doesn't just reverse it and make the one group that was the enemy all of a sudden looking at the other as the enemy. He begins to shift the perspective. It's one of the great reversals that is Jesus. So you heard this song, The Village. I'm so glad that Keaton was willing to sing that song. In there it says, there's nothing wrong with you. It's true, it's true. There's something wrong with the village, with the village. There's something wrong with the village. Feel the rumors follow you from Monday all the way to Friday dinner. You got one day of shelter. Then it's Sunday, hell to pay, you young lost sinner. The village. The church, I think, in this case, it has judged and condemned and damned those that it has deemed the enemy. I was rereading some sermons from the late 1700s. It's kind of the end of the great revival movement known as the Second Great Awakening. And there were a number of sermons that I read where the preacher suggested that there was a problem, what he, and I quote here, the Indian problem making the indigenous people of these lands the enemy, suggesting that they were the enemy of Christianity. They were standing in the way of God's movement. Manifest destiny was the thinking. And there were some ministers who suggested that because these, in, these Indians could never be cleansed of their heathen ways, the only response was either to push them further back or to kill them. People were drawn to the message. They were inspired by that message. Enthused because there was a clear enemy. Oh, now I understand what my purpose is. I know what I am to fight against. But what if the vision of community set forth by Jesus never intended to have an enemy? In this current moment of time, Transgender, gender fluid, gender non-conforming individuals, drag performers, they have become the enemy of Christianity because there is a large segment of Christianity that does not know how to be Christian without having the other, without having a named enemy, without having that group that we either must change or destroy. A sermon preached a month ago in the state of Washington suggested that both transgender individuals and their parents should be killed. Less than a year ago, a sermon series preached here in the state of Texas didn't just insinuate, but clearly said that such people should be shot in the head. Now, these are extreme examples, but they are more common than one might think. Because so much of Christianity 
is entirely built and structured on having some horrible, feared enemy that we can demonize. Though the interesting thing is how the enemy has changed over the years. Even in the last 30 years, the church has gone through over a half dozen groups that have been deemed the enemy. It reminds me of the TV preacher, and this is true story. He produced a book that named the date of the end of the world. Sold thousands of copies. The day came, the day went, the world still existed. And so he revised the book with a new date. You would have thought on the seventh revision that people might have started to ask questions, but I kid you not, the book still sold. The same is true of a Christianity that requires an enemy. But people who are decrying the sudden appearance of trans people, drag performers, those who are gender non-conforming, don't know their history. Greek theater, Roman theater, Shakespearean theater, roles for women were all played by men in drag. And there are stories of those people that played the female roles maintaining their female persona even when they were off the stage and living their life day in and day out. Have you ever looked at the portraits of our founding fathers? Wigs on the men, makeup, some of them are in dresses. I know some women today who would say, if I never have to wear another dress in my life, I will be a very happy person. And I have known men who have tried on a kilt who said, where have you been all my life? In 1959, Tony Curtis and Jack Lemmon were in a movie called Some Like It Hot. Yes, they were in drag. And then in the early 1980s, Bosom Buddies, Tom Hanks, also, there you see him, was in drag. Now most of these examples are simply pointing out how many of the attributes that are associated with one gender or another are in fact social constructs that change continuously and change again. But those who identify as trans people, who identify not with the gender assigned to them at birth, are not, despite what some would say, they're not a new phenomenon. Rabbi Jonathan, who's the rabbi at Jewish Community North, just five minutes from here, he and I were talking not long ago, and he said to me, Bruce, you do know that the Jewish Talmud the Jewish Talmud being the rabbinical teachings and commentary over the centuries. He says, you do know that the Jewish Talmud recognizes eight genders. What? I said, <laughs> eight? Yeah, eight. He sends me an article, which I will post, so if anybody else would like to read it. And what's fascinating is that the Talmud does not judge does not call any of those expressions wrong. It's simply trying to determine how such people fit into the Torah and into the communal rules. There's a lot of interest also in Genesis 1. That poem, that creation poem. You heard a portion of it read just a little bit ago. What does it say about the nature of God when we read, so God created humankind in God's own image. In the image of God, God created them. Male and female, God created them. Both the male and the female image were based on the divine, as the model, as the example, as the starting place. Then you look at the larger poem that is Genesis 1. It says that God created night and day. It does not talk about what we do with the beautiful sunset or the gorgeous colors at the crack of dawn when it's not quite night or not quite day. What do we do with those? Did God create that? When it speaks about God creating land and sea, there's no mention of the swamps or the marshes. Does that mean that that was outside of God's creative work? 
In the poem that is Genesis 1, what a lot of rabbinical people, rabbis, will suggest is that what we're viewing is not this or that, but what we're viewing is the end of the spectrum. And there's a lot in between the two that God also created, between night and day, between land and sea, and even some that suggest between male and female. Now, I know that for a few of you, you just kind of squirmed in your seat when I said that. But let us think about all the moments. No, we can't think about all the moments. We've got to be honest here. Let's think about some of the moments through Christian history when the church has had to say, oops, <laughs> sorry about that, in regard to some preconceived enemy that is no longer an enemy. I, I'm sorry uh, the way I treated you. Uh, that was kind of my fault. Sorry. How many times? Remember, left-handed people were ostracized, were deemed outside of God's plan. Left-handed people during a time of Christianity were deemed to be filled with the devil. How many? No, I won't make you raise a hand. Uh, <laughs> but I have a feeling we got some left-handers in here. Deuteronomy 23, which you heard a portion of that read, says, No Moabite shall be admitted to the assembly of the Lord. Even to the tenth generation, none of their descendants shall be admitted into the assembly of the Lord. You shall never promote their welfare or their prosperity as long as you shall live. To say to the tenth generation, was just a polite way of saying until pigs fly. And the way these people viewed the Moabites... They were their enemy. If suddenly pigs started flying, they would have added, and when camels start doing the tango, because they could not fathom the Moabites being anything but their enemy. And then the story of Ruth shows up, a central story within the Jewish faith, and Ruth is a Moabite. Yeah. So what do we do with that? as she was not supposed to be welcomed into the community of the faithful, and she was. Not only was she welcomed, but later she would find her name in the genealogy for Jesus, thus suggesting that Jesus has a little Moabite blood in him, the very people that were deemed the enemy and were to never, ever be found within the community of faith. In John 16, Jesus there with his disciples at the Last Supper says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, it will guide you into all the truth. I feel like the Spirit is still guiding us today. Away from a world that defines what it means to follow Jesus by paying homage to a list of enemies imposed by a form of Christianity that seems uninterested in seeing how Jesus redefined community. Not with enemies, not with lines, but with love, mercy, kindness, generosity. For those of you who do not know me or know my family, my family arrived at Cypress Creek Christian Church 11 years ago this week. Now, nothing's really changed Changed in our family. If anything, our family has only more fully lived into the identity of what it means to be the Froge family. Because I am now using, and have in most settings for quite some time, used the word daughter to describe my child, who self-identifies as a trans female. Now, that's her story to tell, but she provided me permission to share that this morning. Now, some of you know very well this story because you have a child or a grandchild, a niece or a nephew or a good friend. These are not the enemy of Christianity. In the same way that women were never the enemy of Christianity, though for a while we said that, 
Indigenous people were never the enemy of Christianity. Left-handed people were never the enemy of Christianity. People of color were never the enemy of Christianity. Divorced people were never the enemy of Christianity. Gay and lesbian people were never the enemy of Christianity. And yet people hear this and they begin to freak out and they say, but what will we stand for if we don't have someone, something to oppose? But I think we do. It's called the kingdom of God. And as the body of Christ, it is our only task to love people, even those that others have told us and taught us are not to be trusted, and they are our enemy. Jesus said, love your enemy. And the moment you love your enemy, if you really love them, they're no longer your enemy. A community defined without lines. I am finding more and more people outside of Christianity or who have left Christianity echoing what my grandmother said. I didn't know how wrong I was until I knew how wrong I was. Please understand that there are people, there are churches, there are Christians who are doubling down. They are doubling down calling out trans people, drag performers, gender non-conforming people, naming them as the enemy. And all that does is it creates an unsafe world for these people. Yet if they would only, those who call them out as the enemy, if they would only spend five minutes doing a little bit of research, they would quickly understand that these so-called enemies are not the source of violence in our culture. They are not the source of suffering in our culture. In fact, they are the most victimized people by violence, and they are the ones who are ridiculed and experience suffering probably more than, than I do. And yet there are people that are stepping out of the shadows and saying, this is who I am. And all the scriptures that people try to pull out, I can pull out just as many to counter every single one of those. But I don't want to make this a battle. I do not want to make them into the enemy either. What we need to do is we need to continue to be the church that God has called us to be, which means to put love first in all things. And I'll be real honest with you folks. I am still terrified. A day does not go by where I think about my child going out into the world where I am terrified. And yet I am trusting Christianity that there are a handful of other churches out there like Cypress Creek that are offering a different word, who are offering a different model, who are saying it's time for us to get rid of this old model that is built on the enemy. Jesus said, love your enemy, and the moment he did, remember, he was the one who from the cross, the very people that we would say were his enemy, he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. He loved them from that moment of crisis when he could have just said, that's the enemy. We got a, a lot of people that are hurting. A lot of people. And I am so proud of Cypress Creek to be a community that is striving to put love first in all things. And to say that this is not only a welcoming place, this is an affirming place. And this is a safe place. That takes a lot of thought. It takes a lot of energy. And yet, I really think it's what God has called us to do. Will you join me in prayer? Holy God, creator of all, Jesus never said to his disciples, here are the people you are to hate, or here are the people who are the enemy. Instead, he allowed love to be his identity, his very purpose. Again, even from that moment on the cross, when he could have given a very clear definition of who were his enemies, he chose another path to reveal to us a different way. We ask, O oh God, for your help, your assistance 
in this good work of being the church that your spirit has called us to be. We offer these words in the name of Jesus. Amen.
we're all trying to figure it out, a little behind the scenes. We, we have a, a, a schedule of how the worship's supposed to go. About 10 minutes ago, I just ripped it off because we're way off, off of this. So we'll all get down here. We'll make it work. <laughs> Folks, here at Cypress Creek, communion is open to all. Um, we're going to serve the intention. There's also the cups available if you'd prefer. In just a moment, we'll come forward. We'll take you take the cup, take the intention, and just know that everyone is welcome. If you're hearing this, this is this is God's table. This isn't ours. This isn't Cypress Creek's. You're welcome at God, God's table. On the night that Jesus gathered with, uh, on the night that Jesus was arrested, he gathered with his disciples for a meal. During that meal, he took an ordinary loaf of bread. He blessed it, and he broke it, saying, This is my body broken for you. Later in that same meal, he took the cup. He said, This is my blood, the blood of the new covenant, poured out freely for you, for the many. Do this in remembrance of me. Will you join us as we pray over the meal? Please join me in prayer. Wonderful God, we come to you this day feeling broken and beat down by some aspect in our lives. <clears throat> Each of us are searching for something different. Some of us may seek comfort, some of us may seek peace of mind, and some may seek welcoming acceptance. Whatever it is that we might need, Lord, we know that your unconditional love will provide that which will patch the hole we feel in our lives. God, please open our hearts so that we may hear the pleas and needs of all the people around us and give us the tools that we need to help all of God's children who feel that they can no longer stand on their own. Give us the wisdom to know that all of creation is beloved and provide us with the courage to spread your love to every single person, not just the ones that we think deserve it. In the name of your love, allow us to erase the lines of cruelty and exclusion that our society has drawn. We ask these things as we join together in the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The table is prepared. Please come.
Let me simply say thank you. Thank you for providing me the space to preach that sermon. Um, Not a lot of spaces out there that would allow me to do that without my resignation following it. So thank you for providing me that space. A couple of quick announcements. First of all, reminding the board, we're meeting on the second floor of the youth building immediately after this service, so we'll see you up there shortly. I also want to celebrate the choir. Uh, they're going to be headed out next weekend as they're taking a little choir tour. They're going to go sing at a congregation that doesn't have much of a choir. They're going to do a concert on Saturday night for them and then sing for them in worship. And this is just part of how do we embody the love first life. And so the choir decided they would share this little expression. And I think it's pretty nifty. Um, want to lift up that... Uh, then the following, well, actually, no, that Sunday, next Sunday, July 2nd, we're doing a uh, one-service Sunday followed by lunch. There's sign-up out here to let us know you're coming. We still need a few things of chili, maybe not now, I don't know, but some sign-up out there to let us know so we know how many bags of Fritos to buy because we're going to have Frito pie for lunch. But the service, the one service, will be over in the other space. Lunch will be over in this space, so just remember that. The following week, also a luncheon for visitors and new members. Uh, There's sign-up out here for that. Let us know if you plan to come. We'll make sure there's a space for you, just an opportunity to converse and hopefully learn a little bit more about Cypress Creek Christian Church. And then, uh, for those of you who weren't here in Holy Ground, there was a gender reveal. Evan and Mariah are having a boy due uh, early November, correct? Yeah. We're so excited for both of you. They're going to make some great parents. Great parents. We know they are. As we do every Sunday, I extend an invitation. It is an invitation to come and be a part of this community of faith. It is an invitation to give your life to Jesus Christ or to do so in a new way, in a way that now you're just beginning to see. We can do that by coming forward. We can do so by just wherever we are. Or if you want to, you can take a few minutes. You can talk with me. You can talk with Robert. Uh, You can talk with some of the other elders in our church. I know James is up there. He'd be glad to chat with you. We would love to be supportive of you. I invite you now to rise, whether in body or spirit, as we sing this song of discipleship. Your love is like radiant diamonds bursting inside us. We cannot contain your love.
Well, I get to introduce to you Catherine this, this uh, is it afternoon yet or morning? Still, still morning. I get to introduce you Catherine, and I hope that you celebrate her coming forward this day. And I'm going to extend to her the right hand of Christian fellowship and ask her that age old question Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the God, living God? And will you share that wonderful news with others? I do. Thank yes, you. Because anytime we hear somebody do that, it gives us an opportunity to reaffirm that in our own lives. So I hope that uh, the opportunities that await you this day to be an expression of that love, that you not only will remember you're supposed to do it, but actually do it, because uh, that's what the world's needing. I'm going to invite after our closing prayer for Catherine to join me at the back door, so please introduce yourself not just this Sunday, but in the weeks to come. Let's go ahead and pray our common prayer. Gracious God, may your love and our lives come together in a life lived in love. May Jesus be our mentor and our model. May the world see in us a life that is willing to put love first in all things. Amen.